The Backdoor GA podcast for 2023 is now brought to you by Steed Motor Group. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, visit steedmotorgroup.ie. Joined now by John McIntyre of the Connacht Tribune and former Galway senior editor Craig Lally to look back on uh, Galway's victory over Wexford in round one of the National Hurling League, where they were also crowned uh, Walsh Cup uh, champions as well. Craig, coming to you first, uh, a, a good start really uh, for, for Galway in the league. Yeah, um, it was great to get a... Uh... Off to a winning start um, and grab a bit of silver, silver as well there um, while it was on, on show. So no, look at I think overall uh, Henry has to be happy with the first day out. Um, not an easy place to go to down to Wexford and and get a result. So to uh, come away with the first round win and a bit of silverware, uh, he has to be delighted and and seeing some new talent come through as well. well. You could say really, John, after the perfect start, really. Yeah, um, I wouldn't be giving Galway any great credit for, for beating Wexford any day, to be honest, because I don't think they're up to much, uh, unfortunately, because, you know, they're, they're a great traditional county, they're fantastic supporters, but the record book tells us they haven't won an All-Ireland, only won a single All-Ireland since 1968. Now, Galway beating Wexford on Saturday night was no surprise to me, but it was in the context of what we saw in the opening 25 minutes, because Wexford were basically dictating the terms of engagement. They had a very good puck-out strategy. Galway just didn't seem to be tuned in or switched on. They fell three or four points behind. But really, Galway could have been 10 behind because Wexford had a heap of chances, but they were guilty of some atrocious shooting and left Galway in the game. And eventually the Whites killed Wexford's momentum. And in the second half, when Galway up the ante considerably made a few substitutions at half time, notably Brian Con- Brian Concannon, who whose forceful running caused Wexford significant problems in the second half. And um, you know, Galway just pulled away. They were efficient, economical, uh, did what they had had to do. And and as Greg said, uh, you know, they had a couple of new players on show. Uh, Liam Collins came in. He's a very talented young player. Scored a couple of uh, fine points. Uh, unlucky, the second effort wasn't a goal. So, uh, in the context of the first half, Galway will be thrilled to have won the game by eight points. It seemed unlikely uh, at half time, but Wexford's challenge disintegrated. They had no free taker. Um, basically, Connor McDonald doesn't look like a free taker. Uh, he's an awkward looking style. He did point three or four of them, but I mean, I even saw Dermot O'Keefe taking a free. I never saw him standing over a place ball in my life for Wexford. So, I know Lee Chen was absent, uh, but it's a big problem for them. So overall, you know, the fact that they won the World Cup as well, it's a good start. But they'll be facing a marked step up in class against Cork next on them, Pierce Stadium. The first half uh, in particular, Craig, like, Gower maybe slow to get, to get out of the blocks. Uh, as John mentioned there, Wexford had a huge number of wides. Where did you feel Gower struggled in that opening half? Yeah, um, no, as John mentioned there, like, uh, like the, the score were definitely flatter goal in the first 20 minutes. Um, some bad wides into the scoring end Wexford had, um, just some shooting, stupid shooting from out the field, really. I think both teams were trying to play the similar enough game where they're getting the ball around the full back line, half back line, and players coming off the shoulder, the running game, getting the ball as far as midfield, and then hitting the ball in. Where I think... Wexford let themselves down as the Conor McDonald inside and on Mac inside and full and full forward line and I think Mac was getting the better of Conor when the ball went in and um, that was definitely they were letting themselves down there and then on the efficiency their shooting efficiency was was very poor as John mentioned like the they had five six seven wides free taking was a big like they'll, they'll definitely welcome back Lee Chin for the freeze they just couldn't couldn't get to grasp with the freeze um, and then like I think they had, I think in the first 20, 25 minutes what had them so far in control in the game is that they were getting great return out of their puckouts. Now, how long were they getting great return out of their own puckouts? They were getting re- return out of Galway's puckouts as well. They were getting on all the second balls, all the breaks, they were winning that. I think when Galway got a hold of that in the second half, um, they forced Wexford to hit the ball long in the second half from their own puckouts. Galway started winning the second balls. In, in particular, Porrick Mannion started sweeping up a good few balls there. Jack Grealish had come out from the full back line to the half back line. So, 
for the first 20, 25 minutes, Wexford really controlled their, their own puck outs and goalways. And, and look, at they were getting the better, I think. And as John mentioned there as well, um, Brian definitely made a big difference, as did two or three other subs. Ronan Murphy made a difference. Um, and of course, Liam Collins made a big difference in the second half. So, um, But to answer your question, for the first 20, 25 minutes, I think it was definitely just a goal. We were just slow out of the blocks, very slow out of the blocks. I know there was a few, a few new faces in it, but Bear Connor really in the forwards, the ball was coming out too easy. And um, I think the both both sets of backs would be happy with the first 25 minutes and how it played out. But I think just in regards to efficiency, I think Wexford, when they look back in the game, would have to be awfully disappointed with the way their scoring efficiency was in the first half, but in particular the first 20 minutes. John, Craig mentions there Garage McInerney coming out with the ball. And like in the league in the past, we've seen him at fullback and he's he's did quite well there. Ultimately, he does play most of his hurling for a goal at centre half back. Like, where do you feel Garrow's McInerney's best position is? Uh, it's hard to know at this stage. I mean, he's given Galway great service as a centre half back and was a key man when Galway won the All Ireland in 2017. Look at he's pushing on in years. Um, and as Greg knows, and I know it only too well, the older you get, uh, the legs won't take you where you want to go some of the time. Now, the, the problem with playing in the full back now, full back line in modern hurling, you nearly need more pace in there than out the field, especially in the two cornerback roles. But uh, Garroj was very effective on Saturday evening. I mean, he completely nullified the threat of Conor McDonald and also galloped up the field on one of his trademark solo runs in the first half and set up a point score for Conor Whelan. And Connor was in lively form. I mean, he, he's, uh, his work ethic is exceptional. And he remains central to Galway's championship prospects in 2023. Um, to answer your question, Paul, you know, to have Dahi Burke in reserve, um, and Dahi is a multiple all-star, uh, but I suppose you, you need a couple of options for these key positions. And I say Henry Shefflin going forward, he won't be disappointed that he has the option of Dahi Burke or Garage McInerney to wear the number three jersey. And, uh, you know, he's a great competitor, McInerney. I mean, he comes from great stock. I mean, his dad, uh, Jerry, was an outstanding halfback for Galway in the 80s. And, um, you know, he's a competitive spirit. And when you have that, it can overcome other deficiencies. Not saying that Garage has those, but he is pushing on a little bit. And uh, but look, okay, he he he's um, he's still important to Galway. Even something we did see as well, Craig. Um, throughout the weekend, they probably different. Connor Whelan further out the field. You're usually used to seeing Connor Whelan and Brian Cannon as this two man inside foot forward line, but Connor Whelan uh, playing deeper and creating turnovers as well. Yeah, like I was thinking about that after the game, and I was wondering, like, is is he like he played so well there the last day, obviously, and as John said, like he's worked at ethic and turnover the ball, and when he got the ball in the first half, he was probably the only one that was doing where he was taking on the man, and he created two points himself in the first half by just running at the defence, and it's brilliant that he's out the field doing that, but I don't know, you're losing something inside then. No, don't get me wrong, when Brian came on, he was brilliant, and he he created what Connor would normally do inside, he was very good in the forward line, but... With Connor and Brian in there, are they just the best? I know Connor Cooney has to come back, and and um, like there's probably one or two other lads to come back and have forward line there. Maybe Davy Burke will be midfield, have forward line. So you have one or two more lads that will come back in that might allow Connor to push in. But he played so well there the last year. I wonder is that his position at 11? Um, his work ethic, like he's the hits he puts in there, like when he doesn't have the ball, and when he does have the ball, there's no getting it off him. So it's very hard to know. Like he's definitely always most valuable player at the minute. Like, and uh, it was funny enough. I was only talking to him there two weeks ago, and he hit me with he hit me with a, a, a bit of information. I that I was pushed back by. Like, he's, you still think Connor is young. Like, but I, this is actually his ninth season with Galway senior hurlers. Like, he came on board in 2015 when he was only 18 years of age. So he's actually this is his ninth year with Galway, which I actually was stunned by. Um, so like I know he's still only young at 26 or whatever he is, but. Like it's still nine tight nine seasons around the goal panel is a long time. So look, he's loads of experience game now as well, like three three yard iron finals along the way there. But um he's definitely he's he's starting to really lead now. So he is and it was great to see him actually break lift the cup the last day as well as captain. So I don't know, is that the case going forward for the year or not? But uh he's he's definitely he's a the main man there, so he isn't I think Henry will be building his whole half or his whole six forwards around him. As a player, Craig, to play with, what's that experience like? 
to play with, brilliant play against a training partner. He's just so strong. Like he's, he's, I was actually, I was, when Liam Collins came on the last day, I was thinking to myself, geez, he, he's, he's so much talent, Liam Collins. Like, and we played him twice. We played him in the championship, um, this or 2022 and the quarter final 21. And he's such a handful. Like, you know, he's lively, he's quick, he's fast. And I just thought the last day, if he can put on a bit of bulk now and, do you know, who, who could he be like now? And I just thought when Connor came on the scene in 2015, Connor was similar in size to, to Liam, like, but like you look at Connor now, like, and he's an he's a, he's an absolute animal, like, and you know if he hits you while you have the ball, you know about it. But if you're trying to get him off, trying to get the ball off him while he has it, you know about it. And that's that's the best way to explain it. Like he's just he's so in your face when you don't have the ball, and he's his work his work rate is unbelievable, and it's it's the best I've ever come across. And he's so hard to mark. He's a real low center of gravity when he gets the ball in, so it's impossible to tackle him. And um, no, he's just he, he like he's definitely one of the finest hurlers in the county now at the minute and or in the country. Sorry, so like it's it's just so key to Henry that he keeps him in in f fully fit and in good shape for the for the rest of the season because like it's great to be able to say where do you play him because he plays so well everywhere. Where did you play him, John? Um, it's a bit of a dilemma because, like as Greg pointed out, you move him out the field. You take away his goal-scoring threat inside, and I think a lot of the league for Galway is about mixing and matching some new guys with these more established players, and then trying to build a team and finding out where the best balance is and where do you play certain players to give you that that balance. Uh, he's obviously a very versatile forward. Um, his his ability to secure possession in tight corners is is nearly unmatched in in at inter county level, and uh, he's power he's a powerful player. He's very strong, and um, it's great to have have him there uh, for Galway. And the fact he was captain on Saturday night, like Greg, I don't know whether that's a long term arrangement. I think he's a he's a fellow that that might thrive on the responsibility. Uh, you could play Connor Whelan anywhere in the Galway forward line, but if it was left to me, I'd probably hand him the number fourteen jersey because he has a great hand on him to to to, to grab a high one, and um, I would think he he'd spark insecurity in a full back line straight away if they saw him on the edge of the square. But look, at it's early days yet, and uh, who knows what we'll be thinking. In, when Galway conclude their league campaign. Uh, it was great for, the, for them to make a winning start on Saturday. Wexford Park is not the easiest venue to get a result in, but Wexford didn't help themselves last Saturday night. And I was just making the point in my match report this morning that if Galway were playing Limerick or Kilkenny last Saturday evening and they presented those teams with the type of opportunities that Wexford didn't take, the match could have been over at half time. So, you have to keep that in mind in, in terms of the Galway win. Galway were poor in the opening 20 minutes, got away with it because the opposition didn't punish them. They left them hanging on. And ultimately, Galway just have a better better team and better players than, than, than Wexford, even though, like, the, like their hosts, they were missing a number of regulars. Was that just loose marking, John, or with the opportunities they presented themselves, or... Was it the conditions in the first half? Because it definitely did seem to, I suppose, not be the conditions didn't seem to be as bad in the second half. Well, there was there was a wind, and I think it was a bigger influence than maybe those of us on the sideline thought. Uh, Galway just didn't seem to be switched on. Look, it was a long journey down in the first place, and a team is always vulnerable. I think in that situation, then there was a bit of drama before the game. We all had to be evacuated from the stand because there was a, a, a small fire, an outbreak of a small fire uh, towards the back of the stand, I believe. And at, at one stage, we didn't even know would the game go ahead. There was no public announcement, so we're kind of all in the dark. And um, But at the end of the day, Galway just were, were they laboured in, in, in the opening quarter. Uh, they were kind of following around Wexford rather than the other way around. Uh, Mark Fanning was very accurate with his puck outs. But even at that, Galway were just conceding too much freedom and space, and Wexford had time to work the ball through to work the ball through the lines, and they did that very efficiently. 
because they created a heap of scoring chances. They had 10 points in the first half. They had 10 wides. And they also, Ian Murphy also had to make a, a brave advance to deny Kevin Foley. And another effort from out the field went into Ian Murphy's hands as well. So, you know, Galway gradually got to grips with the situation, uh, even though Wexford's wastefulness aided that, 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 that scenario. And, you know, once Evan Nyland, um, he missed his first two frees, which was unusual to see. But basically, his accuracy underlined what Wexford were missing on the night. I mean, he scored 10 points. Some of them were, were long range from difficult angles. And it's only when you don't have a good free taker that you appreciate one. Evan Nyland's definitely up there, Craig, with like top free takers. Like he's one of those 95% free takers. But in the past, we've seen him start off where he takes the freeze in the league and then you might start for the championship. But do you feel it'd be different this year? Um, like I suppose the last day he missed, as John said, he missed his first two frees and I missed them well, like, which is very, very rare of him. And I said, Jesus, this one is going to be one of these days that it just doesn't work for him. And, I think he, uh, the next two frees he got, he actually won them himself, which definitely helped him along. Like so, uh, he he worked he worked well. I think he he overturned the ball in, in one of those, and he got the two. He won the two frees himself, so that gave him confidence. And after that, as John said, he was just pinging them from all sides. To answer your question, like I I think that Evan Evan is probably he's probably not getting the credit he deserves from open play. Um, in the last two years or three years in, in club championship and in, and in inter-county. Like, he does an awful lot from open play. He works hard. Um, and for that reason alone, I think there's a spot for him outside of the freeze. Like, he's probably one of the best free takers in the country. Um, like, you know, especially since Joe has gone now as well, I think, the, like, all the more reason why he should be there. And I, I think there's definitely a spot for Evan there at 11. And to go back to where would you play Connor? I'd be the same as John. I'd play him the forward line. I'd have Evan at 11 there. Um, and I think that's his best position. He likes to sit back in the pockets and he'll, he'll, he'll pop points all day. There has been a lot of debate about this uh, Allianz Hurling League and what value it has for teams. John, like for you, what's your point of view on, on the league as a whole? Because like even last night in the Sunday game, the point was that there shouldn't be league semifinals. The league is getting a bad rap these days there's no question about that and I think after Waterford's experience experience in 2022 where they were burning it up in the league were very impressive in the final and then the kind of I won't say the collapse in the championship but the, 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 the just really flatter to deceive I was reading a couple of interviews from Waterford players at the beginning of the year and they seemed to indicate that after they won the league final they went straight back hard at it the following Tuesday evening in other words, they didn't even get a chance to appreciate winning the, the, the country's second most hurling competition. And I think th th they were over the top nearly by the time they started playing the championship. I know they beat Tipperary in the first round in, the, in, in Walsh Park, but they weren't overly impressive. And they probably got their timings wrong last year at Waterford. So against that background, there's this self-fulfilling prophecy that the league doesn't matter and, um, you know, Managers are only using it to blood new players and get a settled 15. But I don't think that, that that's a fair commentary or even an, an accurate commentary. I mean, nothing beats winning. I mean, there was nearly 20,000 people in Parky Keefe last Saturday night for, for Cork and Limerick. And there was 8,200 in, in, in Wexford Park. Now, the perception is that there'll be bigger crowds and better matches at the start of the competition than there will be for the league semi-finals and final because of the, of the closeness of the championship. And herein lies the difficulty. There's so many matches being squeezed into the inter-county calendar between January and the end of July. Something has to give. I would never devalue the league. And I, I expect, for instance, next Sunday in, in Salt Hill, that Cork are going to come up fully loaded and really test themselves against Galway. They have a new manager down there in Pat Ryan. Unfortunately for them, Ronan O'Flynn, who scored a brilliant goal against Limerick, he's out with a dislocated angle, ankle. And they're also missing Dara Fitzgibbon and Mark Coleman. Who, Fitzgibbon is, is a superb athlete. Coleman is a beautiful hurler, beautiful stick man. But, you know, they, they seem to have uh, uh, plenty of, of, of talent. Should go back to Torres last year, sure. 
I mean, how Cork didn't beat Galway in that all, all, all Ireland quarter final with all the goal scoring chances they had in the first half? I mean, Galway were very fortunate to win that game. Now, it's a tribute to, to them that they managed to come out on the right side of the result. And I suppose the difficulty for Cork at the moment, they haven't won in All Ireland since, since 2005. Fans are, the team management is under pressure, the players are under pressure. And then when it comes to these clutch moments in matches, they're struggling to, to finish off the opposition. So um, it'll be interesting to see how Cork get on on Sunday. And I think we'll know a little bit more about Galway after this game. Galway's recent record against Cork is quite impressive. And, um, but I expect a good crowd in, in Salt Hill on Sunday. And I think it's an opportunity as well for the local followers to, to come out and get behind the Galway hurling team. I mean, if you have 19,000 in Parky Key, it looks shocking if Galway only get a crowd or three or 4,000 in Salt Hill on Sunday. And that has been the case fairly regularly over the past four or five years. Why is Greg, that will been, Greg will vindicate that more than me. I mean, he's been out there for Galway. And they really should be attracting bigger crowds. Now we can say, oh, the problem with Pierce Stadium, it's on the wrong side of the city. These Galway hurling fans won't travel in. But I think that's a I think that's becoming a very convenient excuse for for people not to rally behind the hurlers. Why is that being the case, Craig? Do, do you feel that maybe the Galway hurlers haven't got as big a support as some other counties throughout the league? Um, I suppose expectations are so high within the Galway community as well. Like, and I suppose 2018 their Ireland final, 2019 got knocked out by Dublin, and haven't been back in their Ireland final since. And like, don't get me wrong, there's some absolute from my time there, and even John, I'm sure, as manager there, like he tell you, there's some absolute diehards there that I go from mm. to Antrim, no problem. It's like you'd often meet supporters that'd be making a weekend out of the likes of Wexford there now and they could have a couple of kids with them, etc. And there's some absolute diehards there. But I suppose then, as John said, there might be just parts of strong Langoway for hurling and they just mightn't travel in or, you know, if things aren't going great, the, the daggers will be out. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is in Galway. And um, if you are not reaching our Ireland finals or if, you, if you've won a bad game, if you won, you've won loss and all of a sudden the knives come out and that can happen, I'm afraid. And with that, then the sport goes down a small bit for his... As John said, if you look at Cork, like, like Cork haven't won their Ireland final since 2005, but they will absolutely come in their droves and numbers and all that. And even my good neighbours here over the road, Claire, they're the same way. Like they'll just come in droves. And I can't be, that mightn't always be the case for us, I'm afraid, and go away, but it's the only thing I can really pinpoint to it. But um, yeah, like you just hope, as John said, you'd hope the numbers come out again on Sunday now against Cork. Like, you know, it's going to be an absolute massive step up compared to the Wexford game and it'll be a totally different prospect completely and as John said like yeah it was great to get silverware at the weekend it was great to get the win it was great to see a few new players out there but the, uh, Henry will know this himself and they have the management team they know it. the step up the next day is going to be massive and it's going to be a totally different prospect and the lads will just have to be ready for it and I'd imagine that Henry will probably bring a bit, a bit more experience to the, to the team the next day like Brian will probably have to start and a few more lads might be back and you know, he'll have no choice it's because especially Cork will be on the crest of a wave after they win the last day. So um, it's going to be a big, big, tall task. And as John said, come Sunday evening, you'll know, you'll know a bit more about Galway. Yeah. Just interested to get your views as well, Craig, on the league as a whole. Do you, do you feel it's being valued by players and management involved in this or even from your own experience? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I, like, I think it's it's still there. Like, there's... Like, as a, from a player's point of view, like, even there the last day, there were so many new players starting for Galway the last day, like, for instance, TJ Brennan, like, on the wing, I'm sure he probably had a point to prove after the last couple of years. And there's more TJs like that along the, on the way um, that when they get that jersey in the league, and I, I know that for myself, you don't want to give it back because you know if you lose that in the league that, you know, if you're not a, a regular starter down through the last couple of years, that the chance of getting it back for championship is, is, is awful hard. So every player is thinking that in the back of their mind. If I have a good league campaign, it's put me put me in a good position to be on the championship team. And that's what it's all about. So I think every player that goes out at the minute is thinking to themselves, geez, as the old saying goes, when I get the jersey, I don't want to give it back easy. So I think that's in the back of their minds. And, and in regards to Henry or any county management team, they want to get the most out of the league as well. Because as John said, they want to bleed as much players as they can. And winning is, winning is a great thing. Like So... 
Like you, you need to stay winning and stay winning. And if you lose games, if a bad mentality creeps in from it, like Sean, 2017 when we, we won the league, we went on to win there in Ireland. It was all about winning and having momentum going forward. So I don't think anybody wants to get out knocked out of the league early. And you know, like as John says, with Waterford last year, you can time your run well, but you can time your run badly as well. If you get knocked out of the league good and early and you five or six weeks, that can work both ways. Do you know what I mean? There's only so many tra- so much training you can do and you can't be playing matches. So I think for any management team or any inter-county setup, just go for the league. Go as far as you can and try and win it. And I think that's the way most management are thinking. And I know it's not ideal week on week and you'll have a few injuries popping up here and there. But if you can just, as John said, bleed in a few new players and kind of look after the players you have. as the same with Connor earlier on. Like you just have to, the main players, you have to look after them and uh, give them the rest they need as well. But try and win as well along the way. Yeah, like uh, uh, that's what it is for these new players trying to break through. The league is a huge opportunity for them, John. But even some of them new players that featured in Wex- Wexford on Saturday evening, is is there any particular one or two players that's, that stood out for you, John? Well, we've already mentioned um, Liam Collins. Uh, I've seen him playing uh, for Galway at underage level. And um, he's, he's a, a touch player. Um, very skillful. There's a bit of height to him. Now, Greg mentioned earlier about that he has to bulk up, and that's understandable, and and that will happen in due course. But he, such are his high skill levels that it will help him to get out of trouble. Um, and I suppose he has to be, given his age profile and his inexperience, he has to be kind of a forward that's living living off the breaks. Uh, there's no point him in being under a high drop ball with a six foot three, uh, um, Dan Morrissey or somebody else like that. Uh, but he is very promising, and um, I, I think he's all the attributes to make it at, at the highest level. They had um, Owen Lawless of Atten Rye playing at, at wing back the last day. Uh, didn't stand out, but he wasn't cleaned out either. And uh, I, I think they have to have a, a, another look at him. I mean, he, he, he's a good hurler and um, Don Lachey, uh, son of Eamon O'Shea, the former Tipperary hurler and team manager, uh, nice hurler as well. Has he the, 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 the physical stature to survive in the white heat of championship? The jury uh, would be out in that. Uh, Evan Nyland is obviously a bit more experienced than, than either of those players. I think for Evan, he, he needs start picking off a couple of points from play uh, as well. Uh, that he's, he's not just sort of um, burdened with this reputation as being a free taker. He needs to give Galway a little bit more than that. And he has the capacity to do so. Tiernan Killeen, a uh, young fella again, very versatile, good stick man, you know, was playing for a wing forward for Loch Ray in, in, in the county final and replay. Uh, he got a couple of games at wing back uh, last year in the league. He lined out at midfield last Saturday. And a bit like Sean and Nan in the first half, the kind of game passed him by a little bit. Uh, now he still scored a point. You know, maybe he's a little bit harsh taking him off at half time. Uh, Sean and Nan was kept on. And in fairness to Sean, he, he stepped up, stepped it up considerably on the resumption, scored a fine point, was much more involved. And, you know, it's all about experience for these players. I mean, you can see their Greg's own club mate, Jack Grealish. Um, you know, Jack is improving all the time. He's, he's a competitive spirit, quite tidy uh, at the weekend in a full back line where Garrosh McInerney mastered McDonald and, and Darren Morrissey had, a, had, a, had an excellent second half. So, uh, but, you know, I think in general, Galway need to find one or two new players who will cut it in this year's championship because what they've had for the last couple of years are just falling short, uh, even though they gave a very good account of themselves against Limerick in last year's All-Ireland semi-final. Even there, uh, Craig, John Minton, Sean Lennon really grew into that game in the second half. And for a lot of people, like Sean Lennon was playing very well, just unfortunate last year to do his cruciate, but he's he's back now from it. And he's definitely a player that could add something in, in midfield for Galway. Yeah, Sean is like he's he's a good experience behind him now as well. Like he's around for two years in the boy panel, but very unfortunate with injuries down through his career, not just last year. Um, but he like 
like all those Linens, he's just have a tough mentality and he can back very strong from it. And he's in great shape and he's he's always physically very good. Um I thought in the second half the last day, he really came into the game, got a cracking point of his left, but he was winning the dirty ball as well, and he was up and down the field and like that's what you need from McDeal. And like I I just think that he he definitely has something to offer there. Um like as as John said, like it's probably a flick of a coin between himself and Tierney and Tierney and Killeen to get took off at half time and he was left on and I thought he did well in the second half and he was probably some of the reason why they turned it around so so quickly. Um just go back to, to your point there with John. I think I think Liam Collins is definitely he's going to be a player that's going to be for the next ten years a standout for Goa. Um he's one that needs to really, really come into the team this year. Um I also think Martin McManus, I'd love to see him get a few minutes in the league as well, just see what he's about. A great club campaign there with Lock Ray. He's a big, strong fella as well. He might bring something different to the table. Um and I, I liked I thought Tierney Colleen there, like where Kevin Foley was starting to he's he dominated for Wexford in the first twenty minutes of the last. He got on loads of ball himself and Jeremy O'Keefe in the middle of the field. And I thought that just before half time and Galway started turning around, maybe twenty five minutes on, I thought Tierney got on a lot of the ball. He hit a great ball into the corner, into Jason Flynn, and got two or three lovely balls from him, and he was starting to get control of it. And probably a bit unlucky to get to off at half time, but I think as well watching him all through the year with Lockray and even last year with Goy, he has the potential to be an intercounty hurler and a good one at that. He's all the attributes. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, and he's lovely hurling wrist as well. So definitely them three players, Mark McManus, um, Tiernan Killing, and uh I'd like to see Jamie Ryan get a run again as well. I know he's injured at the minute. Or I think he wasn't talked the last day, but I'd like to see Jamie get another run. Um, I think he's had a great, he's off the great, a great, not great campaign there in the club. Um, and I'd just like to see Jamie get a bit of a run as well in the forwards and see what he's about now. Um, but other than that, like, you know, I have a few other lads as well to come back. And hopefully the the likes of the older heads, like Shane Cooney now is back in full training again. 802, he's back in full training again. Um, and then Connor and Davy are supposed to come back along as well. John, the most noticeable thing in that second half, when you, when you just look at the goal performance, the work rate of the forwards in particular, they all seem to really hunt impacts around that middle third and create turnovers, which ultimately led to a couple of frees from Evan Island and then like Brian Cannon coming inside as well made a major difference. Yeah, Brian Cannon, I think, ignited the goal forward line a little bit in the second half. He's a very forceful player, player strong runner, Aggressive, not afraid of timber, well able to give it out. Uh, be a tough individual now to mark. And there was just more aggressiveness about Galway when they didn't have the ball in the second half on, on Saturday evening. I would imagine the message from the management at half time. Look at lads, you're giving Wexford too much time, too much space. You're showing them too much respect. Uh, just get in there amongst them and shake them up. And that's what Galway did. And obviously the wind was a bit of a factor as well in, in helping the game to turn around. I think Wexford gradually got a bit demoralised with all the free chances they had missed and the free taken not going that well either. And, um, you know, look at Galway finished very strongly. And um, if you didn't see the game and you weren't at the match and you're, you're hearing the scoreline going home from... Mass or from uh, from pulling sheep from a yo or herding cattle or whatever the case may be, twenty three points to fifteen. You'd be saying if Limerick did that or Cork did that, God, that that's an impressive evening's work. And at the end of the day, it's all about winning. And um, sometimes it really doesn't matter how you get there. Now, as we've said earlier, Wexford didn't help themselves. Kept Galway in the game when maybe Galway should have been, you know, six or seven points behind. But, you know, Galway just had a greater skill set, the better hurlers, uh, they probably have a more in-depth squad. And all those factors told in the end. And um, for Henry as well, to get a, his first piece of silverware as Galway in management. Look at the Walsh Cup in the overall scheme of things is probably not worth a hill of beans. But it's important for, for Shefflin. I think it's important for this Galway team. They can only win will say four competitions this year. The Walsh Cup, the National League, the Leinster Championship and the All-Ireland title. So first one is already on the sideboard. And that gives them a little bit of momentum going into next Sunday against Cork. It is going to be a, a completely different type of game. Cork are very athletic, strong runners. They seem to be playing a more direct brand of hurling 
uh, looking at them, looking at the bigger highlights on, on Saturday night against Limerick. Uh, obviously, they have injury problems, but look at Cork, you know, a county with Cork's tradition and and uh, should, should have no problem in, in filling those vacancies. And it's an opportunity for, for Ryan and his management team to throw the eye over some new players. I think they'll be, I think they'll be gunning for Galway on Sunday. I'm not saying they're going to they're going to come up from Cork and 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 beat and beat Galway, but I I I believe it will be a very competitive struggle, despite what t- people think about um, shadow all this potential shadow boxing in the league. I I think there's there is a little bit of that, but not as much as people think. Craig, even Brian McCann there at the end, uh, the point where he just loses the hurl. It show, shows a bit of Gaelic football skills people mightn't have been aware he had and get to over the bar. Like it, it was a remarkable how he was able to kick that over the bar. Yeah, and he showed great strength in the ball that came in as well. Um, you know, maybe two or three years ago, Brian would have been pushed off the ball there. But it just shows how strong he's got over the last couple of years. He was able to hold off the man, win the ball. And it was great. It was class finish where he was able to kick it. But like, it, it, he, he, as John said, like he, he brought so much to it. Like, he actually was very unlucky for a goal as well. There was remember that set play that started over in front of the, the management team and worked its way back along. It was all short passing, 15, 20 yard stick passes, worked its way up. I think Jason Fling got a point out for finish, like, but that was awful lucky. That would have been a brilliant goal. Um, but like that, his movement inside, and like I think himself and Connor inside in a two man for forward line are just they're close to being unmarkable when they're on 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 song. Um, but like I I think that. Like just mentioned there as well, just thinking there as well, there's an awful lot of players still to come back into that team or maybe the players that are there, as I was saying to you, try and keep them off the team. Like we never mentioned Fintan Burke, Cahill Mannion, Rowan and Glennon. So like the strength and depth of Galway, it's great to see the last day some of them players st- stepping up to the plate. And there'll be other players disappointed as well that probably didn't get, they probably like the likes of Tom Monaghan who probably didn't have his best game the last day and who was so good for Galway the last year. There's so much more left in him. Um... You know, there's one or two others. Parik Mannion was kind of in and out of it for the way Parik could be. I know he came into it the last 10 or 15 minutes, but he likes to normally get on an awful lot more ball. And there's a few other players that'll, that'll really look forward now to getting going against Cork the next day. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Like, and as I said to you, I think with the, the likes of the Cork game on Sunday, if there's any lad that holds their jersey from last week, they'll be saying, right, what do I do to make sure I'm holding it again for the next day and I, I don't lose my jersey and they're looking over their shoulder, these lads coming along. Um, but... I just think that it'll be it's going to be a really really good game on Sunday and it'll it'll set up nicely then to see um it'll set up nicely to see where the younger lads they stand as well like if the likes of Liam Collins comes on it'll be a step up again to see where he stands against the likes of the Cork full back line and so you know, I looking forward to it. I make it all together eleven players in total who are missing from the weekend which include Di Burke, Joseph Clooney, Paul Mannion, David Burke, Fintan Burke, Connor Clooney, Shane Clooney, Keenan Fahey, Ronan Glennon. Kevin Cooney and Adrian Tui, like significant absentees, John. Yeah, but they still had 15 players on, on the field. Uh, I, I also, sometimes I just think it's a very lazy narrative to be talking about players that you're missing as if as though they had nobody deputising for them. Mm-hmm. The reality is, like, God, we had 15 players on the field at the weekend. And uh, I, some, I believe... Too much of a big deal is made about who's not playing, who's not there. Uh, obviously, those players that weren't involved on Saturday night, there's a hard core of experience there. And I suppose that's the challenge for Henry Shetland and, and Damien and Kevin. is to basically mould together their 15 best players in their best positions. And that's not a simple process. And it's some, sometimes you only get to the end of that line in an All-Ireland final. I mean, we've seen over the years the way Brian Cody was able to pull rabbits out of the hat for All-Ireland finals, notably against Galway back in I think 2012, Greg, with Walter Walsh. And yeah. um, so, like, it's an ongoing process. Uh, so I wouldn't be too wrapped up about the players that Galway are missing. I think the focus really should be on who's wearing the maroon jerseys in these opening round matches of the National League, seeing how to get on. Because, as I mentioned earlier, it is critical that Galway have at least two new championship deputants playing against Wexford in the opening round of the championship, or at least two players who have been, who we haven't seen much of at this level. 
because what they have had up to now the past two or three years, they're not far away, but as a team, they're just falling short. With this court game now, this weekend, Craig, like as we mentioned, it's, it's really a fantastic game. Cork are on a high after that narrow victory as Jane Kingston's late point against Limerick. But this can really, I suppose, put supporters and show the team themselves where they're at. Yeah, I, I like. I think that I suppose going into training out today or tomorrow that Henry will be looking back at the Wexford game and seeing why they were so slow out of the blocks for the first 25 minutes. And if they do that against Cork the next day, what will the ramifications be? And as John mentioned at the start of the podcast, if they do that against a, a Cork or a Limerick or a Kilkenny, they will be down in the scoreboard and down quite a bit. So I think he needs to look at that and see where they need to improve. Um, I think straight away, I think their puck outs, I think they need to work on their puck outs straight away. I don't think it was working. Um, I think they were conceding the short puck out to Wexford, which Wexford worked very well. So if they do that to Cork, which Cork like to play as well, that will not work out well for them, I think, the next day. So I think they either need to push up the six forwards, man for man, force the ball along on, on the Cork puck out. On the flip side, on, the, on their own puck out, Aina's short puck out was perfect, it was working well. But it didn't always work coming out. It worked if Jack and Darren were getting it off the shoulder and they were bombing on. That was fine. But if the ball was played across the field once or twice, Owen Lawless played it across to TJ Brennan or Porrick and it broke down, if that happens the next day as well, they'll be punished. So I think they need to work on their own puck out. They got a hold of the puck outs in the second half. And as mentioned earlier on the podcast as well, Connor and them started winning the dirty ball in the second half, the, sec- the, the second phase ball. That was fine. But... I said, like, if, if they'll find themselves seven or eight points down at half time, if they're that slow out of the blocks and if their puck outs aren't that great and if they're not winning the second ball, it's the next day. So I think Henry look at all that the next day and whatever way he lines out the team, it'll be lined for that. And, um, you know, I think on, on the flip side with Cork, Cork are they're very fast. They'll be, they'll be kind of a, a more experienced Wexford in how they play in regards to the short ball, the runners off, the, off but they've probably a better quality of scores. So they'll be way more efficient with their shots. And I think all oh, we're just going to be not need to be an awful lot tighter. Um and don't be don't be giving up shots too easy the next day. And if they give away the same amount of freeze against Cork, Patrick Horgan will push them an awful lot more as Patrick Horgan's an awful lot more experienced free taker um than what Wexford had in show the last day. So look, there's loads to work on from the last day, and I, I'm sure there'll be a full week now going through all that. Um and look, that that that's part of the league as well. It just goes up and up and up, up and up in levels. And uh, every team you play week by week, it's stronger. So, look, that's the joys of it. And I, I think that, like, and I know John mentioned there, you don't actually mention the, the lads that are out because there are 15 lads in the pitch. And as I said earlier on, the 15 lads that are out in the pitch, if, if there's the Owen Lawless or the TJ Brennans or the Jam Mannions or whoever it may be, get their jersey again the next day, you just make sure that the likes of the Carl Mannions or the Joe Cooney's or whoever, they need to make sure that they're, this is a prime example now the next day if they get it against Cork, that they're, they're holding on to the jersey for the next game. But um, I think with the puck outs as well, just the last day, in a, that down through the years in Galway, you had Joe Cooney in the wing or Johnny Glynn in the wing or Cahill will be there in the wing or Conor Cooney. They're all big six foot one, two lads. They're well able to win their own ball. I think Galway kind of lacked that a small bit the last day that they didn't have any one, route one option that you could go on. Like if you look back to the match last day, there was very few puck outs caught clean out of the air. It's was such a big factor for Galway down, the, down through the last few years. And, I know if Joey Cooney was there in the wing, he'd be that type of go-to man or whatever, like or even Cahill or Connor Cooney. And I think Galway lacked that a small bit the last day. So maybe that might be something that Henry looked to the next day that, you know, if we have to go route one, who do we go to? Like, so, like I know Connor is good in the air and that, but maybe like yeah, they need to try and get someone more on the ball there for them puck outs. And John, like if you, just to finish, like you did reference earlier on in the podcast, like if, if Galway afforded, I suppose, the opportunity Wexford got, like a, like to a cork or something, like that they're definitely going to be vulnerable. And as Craig mentions there as well, with the puck outs, like, like they're, they're probably two of the kind of bigger areas that they'll probably definitely need to improve on for cork this weekend. Yeah, what I say is the same for most teams, Paul, to be honest. Um, and every game is different. I mean, next Sunday in Pierce Stadium, look, at the moment, the, the long, medium-term weather forecast looks okay for the game, but uh, Salt Hill can be a very hostile place at times. There's generally a win there. You could have a situation where one team has first use of the elements and through no fault of the opposition, 
they could be seven or eight points up and it can give a false impression of both teams' qualities. Um, look, at Galway, like every other team at the moment, are possibly Limerick or, or a work in progress. Uh, Liam Cahill is a new manager in Tipperary, for instance. Cork have a new manager. Davies back in Waterford. So there's going to be a lot of tweaking going on in, in, in the National League. Galway, uh, I know it's Henry's second year, but this is kind of his first opportunity to stamp his own uh, impression on, on Galway uh, because he, he knows the local scene much better. Uh, when you take over a team as an inter-county manager, you're kind of inheriting the squad from the previous year. And it's, it's very difficult to apply the acts because you don't have the information and the knowledge and, and awareness of, of, of exactly what talent is available. So Henry is probably a lot more comfortable as Galway team manager in 2023. Uh, I know he's the most decorated hurler of all time, but you know his family had a very difficult time last year with, with his brother Paul passing uh, unexpectedly. That shook him to the core. Then you had all the drama and the controversy over the, the handshakes with, uh, with, with Brian Cody. Um, I, I think that was challenging for Henry as well on a personal level. Um, and, I, you know, I, I've written about it. I, I, I don't give Brian Cody much credit for the way he conducted himself in, in, in those situations, given that he was dealing with a player who had given him so much as a Kilkenny player and who a few weeks earlier had only buried his brother. But that's a story for another day. Uh, so look at an all-known form. Galway are not that far away. But Limerick at the moment are, are still the team to beat. And the purpose of the National League for Galway is to put them on a war footing for the championship with the best team they can possibly muster, notwithstanding any injuries or loss of form. Uh, I expect them to come out of Leinster. I, I just don't think Wexford are good enough. Dublin are obviously going to get a bounce from Michal Dunn, who's been involved with them. Kenny or to Kenny. They don't know how to give up. And it's Galway should comfortably come out of Leinster. And depending on the draw after that, they could have a very big championship campaign. Uh, but the, 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 the caveat really is that they need... Fresh blood, new blood, need a bit of pace along the flanks, especially up front, uh, to hurt teams more. And that's the challenge. And it, re it remains to be seen how successful they will be at it. But to have a lot more potential than a lot of the teams out there who are also dreaming of taking down Limerick in 2023. Yeah, some key points there, Craig, and it's obviously very important to find this blood. But just... Do you think Galway, you've been very, I suppose, strong about uh, your opinions on the league, but do you think Henry and this Galway team should look at winning this league? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think they should be going all out for it. I think that momentum is a great thing and I just keep winning and winning. And uh, I think that as the, the league goes on, he should be aiming to have his strongest team by the end of the league and hopefully that's a league final. And that, as John said, mentioned earlier on the podcast, you need to be bringing at least two to three new players, or you just mentioned there as well. Like that, and that has to be, just can't be two forwards. You need to bring a new back along the way, maybe a new midfielder. Um, and whether that's a 19, 20, 21 year old, or that's a 25 or 26 year old who's just starting to show a form in the inter-county scene now, wherever, wherever it is. As John said, they have a panel of players that aren't far away and are as close as you can get to Limerick as any other team in the county, in the country, sorry, but... Uh, they just need to bring two or three new players. That was evident last year against Limerick. Um, they just need to really bring two or three players that they need to bring on when, the, when times are tough. And like I think that, I think that, I think he will get them. I think he'll get them this year. I think he's he's done a great job so far in the Walsh Cup um, by giving loads of people chances and even the last day. And I think that, I think within the panel, I think there's there's definitely there's definitely a strong 19, 20 players that are capable of it. It's a big ask. Limerick are a serious side which have now gained serious experience but um, and they'll be hard beaten because they have done what Galway needs to do over the last two or three years. They've unearthed two or three players along the way and they're starting to make their way into the team now and come on as subs. So 
that's Henry's challenge. As John said, I think he'd be way more comfortable. He'll have seen another round of championship. He'll have seen them more in the flesh. He'll have got to know the lads a lot better, the young and old. And I think he'll feel an awful lot more comfortable in the position. Um, but going back to your question, yeah, I think they need to go all out for the league. I think they just do. I think that, I think they just need to really have a settled team coming into the last game of the league and bring that forward to championship because the gap between league and championship is so small now and it's just you need to have that. I think they were still finding their, their, their main team in the, at the start of championship last year and I don't think they're, they have no major injury concerns at the minute and hopefully that stays the way it is and they're not waiting for anybody to come back. Whoever they have now, they have um, Bar Dahi. I think Dahi is the only one that might be a bit slower than the rest. But uh, other than that, there's, there's loads of potential there and hopefully, um, hopefully they get a, a win on Sunday and that sets them up again nicely. Yeah, it's Cork and Galway uh, in Bish Stadium in round two of the National Hurling League uh, on Sunday at uh, two o'clock. Definitely a game to look forward to. That is all uh, on our podcast uh, for today. Don't forget that this podcast is brought to you by uh, Steve Motor Group. But a big thank you to uh, John McIntyre and Craig Lally for coming on this week's podcast. No problem, Paul.